Council, good to have you with us virtually. Before we begin, a couple of notes. Council, good to have you with us virtually. We've uh, allocated time to each of you. Um, Mr. Peterson, how, how are you splitting time with the guardian ad litem? Uh, Ms. Pierce and I will split the time up the middle, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we've allocated each side 20 minutes, but if we, had, if we have questions, we'll keep asking them. We want to understand your case. And we'll, we'll spend as long as, as we feel we need to do that. So that may uh, mean that uh, at the end of the argument, one of you has, has had more time than the other. That's just a function of how many questions we've had. If we have a question, we will raise our hand. That's to indicate to each other and to you that we'd like to get in the line. So we don't mean to interrupt your sentence, but we would like you to get to us when you reasonably can. If there's a technical glitch, we'll take whatever time is necessary to remedy it. Don't worry if that happens to you, it happens to all of us at one point or another. Probably helps with our bandwidth if you mute when you're not speaking. I think that's it. I think we're ready to start and we will do so with council's appearances. I should note for the record, I'm sorry if I haven't, but this is in Ray JL. Uh, so your appearances, council. Alexander Marshall for the appellant father. Martha Pierce, guardian ad litem. John, John Peterson, assistant attorney general for the state of Utah. Uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you for appearing today. Okay, let's begin. May it please the court. I would first like to address the merits under this court's recently clarified clear weight of the evidence standard, and then address how this court might further refine the standard of review for termination cases. The juvenile court's decision here to terminate father's parental rights should be reversed because it is against the clear weight of the evidence. The evidence is this. Father was six months sober at the time of trial. He was fully engaged in and had nearly completed all of the treatment required in the child and family plan. He had stable housing, stable employment, and most importantly, he had diligently kept up visitation with his children. The court rested its decision to terminate father's rights on three findings. The first is that the court did not know whether father could be successful outside of treatment and had no indication of future success. This is against the weight of the evidence. Father had shown six months track record of success and on a 12 month statutory timeline, that is pretty significant. In addition, his therapist testified very favorably as to his engagement in treatment and his likelihood of success after treatment. He had not relapsed. The juvenile court in short had no evidence that father would not be successful once treatment was completed. In addition, not knowing whether father could be successful is not clear and convincing evidence. And so it does not meet the standard for termination. Can I ask second, you about that? Oh, sorry to interrupt you, but can I ask you about that last point you just you just raised, please? Yes. Um, it, it seems to me that at least there's there's reason to believe that rather than further adjust the standard of review, maybe that we, what we might need to do is focus a little more on the clear and convincing standard and the evidence that was produced here, because may, maybe to the extent there was an error, the error is not taking seriously what it means to have clear and convincing evidence sufficient to, to justify termination. I'm wondering if you might address that, please. So I understand your question. Is that question referring more generally or to this case specifically? This case specifically. Okay. So the short answer is yes. I do think that this can largely be addressed through the clear way to through the clear and convincing standard that this evidence didn't meet that in this case. Um, it's speci specifically with this finding. Some of the other findings, I think, go more in a uh, clear way to the evidence box. They're not so much um, that the evidence that the court relied on what didn't meet the standard, but that there just simply wasn't enough evidence to be to for the weight to be in favor of termination. So with the, with the finding that I just articulated, yes, I think there's a clear and convincing problem with that particular finding. With the two others, however, um, and talking specifically about whether custody could be returned to father, um, the other two were failure to comply with the child and family plan. Uh, the juvenile court placed a lot of emphasis on that, and that was something that happened early on in the case before the children were removed. That placing that evidence is, 
emphasis, sorry, is against the clear weight of the evidence here. Even though it, it surely happened, like father did delay engagement during the PSS portion of the case before the children were removed, that is not informative at the best interest stage because the best interest stage is about a present tense analysis. It's about what the circumstances surrounding the children are at the time of trial. And at the time of trial, father was fully in compliance with the child and family plan. So at that point, that was against the clear weight. Yes. I, I want to I want to follow up on what you just said, but I, I want to make sure Justice Pierce is had it, if he wants to follow up on that. So, so I'm wondering if you can help me understand what sort of time frame the statutory scheme would require in a strictly necessary analysis. Uh, because I'm interested in Justice Pierce's question more than I am whether we should change the standard of review that we just kind of clarified really recently. But I'm also interested in thinking about whether there are any legal errors embedded in what the juvenile court did here. And one of the things that jumped out at me in reading it, and this is what I want to ask you to pick up on, is sort of the time frame focus in the juvenile court's analysis on, for example, it would be um, irresponsible today to, to give custody of these children to the mother or, or to the father. Um, and I'm wondering if you could help me sort of understand whether that's a, 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 a legal standard problem. Is the focus on today a wrong legal standard under the strictly necessary standard or, or elsewhere in the statute? So a few things in that question, just, just a few things going on. So as far as the focus on today, for the best interest analysis, um, the error there would come like you like you implied with the strictly necessary. So whether the court can return custody is a different question than whether it is strictly necessary to terminate rights. And that is part of what we proposed in the reply brief in terms of how this court might provide further guidance to the juvenile courts and how to conduct this analysis. That those two things are separate questions. So in terms of whether it was irresponsible to return custody to father at the time of trial, our position is still that it, that was against the clear weight of the evidence, but where there could be a legal error there, where there is a legal error there, is that it was, that does not inform whether father's rights had to be terminated, because there's a guardianship, permanent custody and guardianship option on the table, and where there is that option on the table, where it is, as uh, the, the wording in BTB says, feas a feasible option that could address the specific problems facing the family, that option has to be taken unless it can't be, they can't address the problems. The problems here facing the family, as the juvenile court found, were substance abuse, particularly alcoholism on the part of father, and domestic violence. Both of those are readily, readily addressable by a permanent custody and guardianship. So by focusing on primarily on whether or not the children could go back to father today, even though you still think that decision was wrong, that create a legal error in terms of the strictly necessary analysis because it didn't look forward to determine whether within some whether maintaining a parental relationship was still possible or whether at some point in the future father could become a fit parent where, where so instinctively that makes sense what you just said um, where would we tie that to the language of the statute where would we most clearly find this idea that look it's it's a legal error if all you've done is to talk about today. You have to give some sort of um, assessment of, of, of more long-term prospects. Even if judges have some discretion to decide at some point enough is enough, if all you're focused on is today, that's a legal error. So that would, the statutory support with that would, for that would come from Section 507's instruction that Termination, and particularly the strictly necessary analysis, is subject to the protections of Section 503. And I'm going to cite the old numbering of the code just because that's consistent with the briefing. It has totally been renumbered, but um, I'm going to stick with, with what we have in the briefing. Um, specifically in Section 503, uh, Section 12, subsection 12, where it starts, wherever possible, family life should be strengthened and preserved. Now, the fitness determination only means that we have to look at that from the point of view of the child. But the phrasing, wherever possible, family life should be strengthened and preserved, is still there. And that means that if at some point in the future, maybe not the day of trial, but at some point in the future, it is possible for the family life to be preserved in any way, the court must do that. 
So if it doesn't, that is legal error. Thank you. And that will that leads me into how um, here the juvenile court's error with respect to the permanent custody and guardianship option was even more apparent for the reasons we've already discussed, but also the findings underpinning that decision were uh, themselves against the clear way of the evidence. For example, the juvenile court found that guardianship could not offer the same degree of permanency as an adoption. This is completely unsupported. A permanent custody and guardianship arrangement is, for all intents and purposes, from the point of view of the child, permanent. Parents cannot petition to remove a permanent custody and guardianship. They can petition for visitation, but that's the entire point of a permanent custody and guardianship is to maintain the parent-child relationship. No evidence was presented to the juvenile court that a guardianship with uncle in this case would be any less permanent than an adoption. In addition, the juvenile court just made the finding that it would be unstable for the children if parents were continually to enter and exit their lives. There is absolutely no evidence that this is what father would have done. Father never exited the children's lives. He diligently maintained contact with them all the way through this proceeding. He did not miss any visits did visit video visits when the children were placed with his, with his brother in Arkansas. There is no indication that he would exit the children's life and still isn't. Could I ask you, um, what was the specific ground? Uh, was there a specific ground under 5071 that the juvenile court pointed to in terminating the father's parole rights? There were several grounds. Um, failure of parental adjustment, the adjudicate mainly it was the adjudication of uh, abuse and neglect from the domestic violence so that was and I believe that was under uh, 34e so that's they, the parents essentially did a no contest to that petition that was the main ground could I ask you one other question it's a little bit of an out of the blue question and it's a perfectly acceptable answer to say haven't thought about that that's a weird out of the blue question justice Lee. that's perfectly acceptable but here's my out of the blue question the, the the mother has appealed on different grounds than the father let's say that we were to agree with the father's grounds but not the mother's um as a matter of just kind of appellate practice and procedure would the mother be entitled to and let's say we that our and i'm not saying this is our decision but just hypothetically, that we were to vacate the juvenile court's order on a ground articulated by the father, but 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 that that ground had not been raised by the mother. What what would that do in terms of how the case goes back to the juvenile court? Because ordinarily we require you know separate parties to file separate appeals. Now the mother has appealed here, just not on these grounds that we're talking about here. So I think if this court were to vacate the decision based on a legal error that it that it believes infected both mother and father's analysis, um, then it would vacate the termination as to both parents. However, if we're looking at just a ground that infected only father's analysis, because of the juvenile courts, the juvenile court's analysis was pretty well separated between mother and father on best interest. It really was like paragraph about mother, paragraph about father. And in that way, it's discernible, depending on, on how this court, or why this court reverses, whether or not that ground would also be a ground for reversal for mother's decision. It is entirely possible that this court only reverses as to father and then either remands to the juvenile court for a new best interest analysis to be done only with respect to father. And I'll, I'll be curious to hear just sort of flagging this for Mr. Peterson and Ms. Pierce, you know, their, their views on that and whether they, you know, have a position on that question. Um, I, this hasn't been briefed and maybe we don't reach it because maybe this is just hypothetical. Anyway, I, I was just flagging it for, for opposing counsel in case they want to be thinking about it. Thank you. Ms. Marichal, it seems that one of the things the district court was or the juvenile court was concerned about was this tension between um, the father making some progress by the time of the hearing and stability and permanency. So the court sort of recognized that the father had made some advances in the months before the hearing, 
but he wasn't comfortable sending the children with father that day, um, even though there were some hopeful signs. I think you have some really good arguments that uh, if the judge were if the judge were looking into the future, there are some good arguments that it might not be strictly necessary that the father um, is making improvements in the present time at the time of the hearing, but the judge wasn't ready to send the children with him yet. And it seems like what made that dispositive for the judge was that he wanted to make the decision right then. He felt like it had gone on for long enough and something final or permanent needed to be done, which didn't end up being permanent, but he, he, he seemed to weigh against the idea of creating a garden, guardianship where father could be tested and see, okay, can you, can you stay sober? Um, because he wanted a final answer for the children. Can you, in the strictly necessary analysis, how does this need for permanency and stability weigh into that? those com kind of competing factors? That's a really difficult question because permanency is a very broad concept. Um, but the way we try to look at it, in child welfare, permanency, despite the word permanent kind of being in there, really what it means is what does the child need for their emotional and physical safety? They need safety, they need stability, they need nurturing relationships with their adult caretakers. If that can be achieved, that's permanency. It doesn't need to be legally permanent or permanent in some like broader sense in order to be permanency. It just needs to achieve those goals for the child, specifically because the best interest analysis is from the perspective of the child. So if as long as that can happen, and more specifically, the juvenile court has to specifically find reasons why that can't happen in a permanent custody and guardianship in order for it to be strictly necessary to terminate. Otherwise, it isn't, much like we talked about with that being a, a legal error in terms of not looking forward enough to see if that was really strictly necessary. The other thing I'd like to mention in response to that question is um, a little bit of an overview of child welfare generally, but the timeline from removal to uh, termination petition, no, from a removal to a permanency hearing, which comes before the termination petition, is um, under the statute 12 months, and there are allowed two extensions if it looks like the parent's substantially complying and there's a good reason to, to extend that those reunification services. I think it's very important to keep in mind that in this case, father's reunification services, meaning all of the support that DCFS was providing father in reunifying him with his children, ended six months after the removal, fully half the time of the statutory timeline and no extensions. Had, for example, the court gone the full 12 months with father, that permanency hearing would have taken place in December, and then there could have been two extensions beyond that for another, like, 18 months total. The, the statute does say, however, right, that the 12 months is not a hard and fast thing, and the, the judge has some discretion, but, I mean, is your point just that but, but there has to be some basis for it that's articulated in the order? Yes. There has to be some basis for, for doing so, and the juvenile court absolutely has discretion to terminate reunification services at any time. But implicit in that is the, the fact that it's going to have this domino effect of making it very difficult then for a parent to avoid termination where they're doing everything that they've been asked in that time. And without the support of DCFS for six months, if that's not sufficient to avoid termination, it begs the question of what is. Because at that point, what else could father have done to prove to the juvenile court that he could take care of his, his children? That's, and that's the, the major concern of this case is just every step of the way was made more difficult for father to regain his rights. I just wanna to briefly touch on our arguments in our reply. Obviously the legal landscape changed significantly uh, between our opening brief and our reply brief. Uh, so that was, that was a little bit challenging, but in terms of the sort of alternative solution that we offered, a lot of it gets to what we've talked about in terms of the juvenile court's errors here today and providing the juvenile courts with clear guidance on the kinds of findings and the kinds of analysis that's required at best interest, specifically giving 
more substance and guidance with respect to the protections in Section 503 would be hugely beneficial to how this court could determine whether or not a juvenile court's decision is against the clear weight of the evidence in the future. For those reasons, we would ask that this court reverse father's termination and give additional guidance on the best interest analysis. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Ms. Marshall. Mr. Peterson, are you next? Um, may, it please Pierce. Court, may it please the court, Martha Pierce, attorney guardian ad litem. I want to speak about this being necessary and particularly in the context of this court's NRA BTD decision and particularly paragraph 70 and 71. In that opinion, this court noted that BTD, that case involved a private termination petition. But this case said that where the state was involved and you had the entire statutory scheme at play, that strictly necessary was not an invitation to disrupt the timeline or the permanency goals at play. And so you have to interpret strictly necessary in terms of the entire statutory scheme. That's a common canon of statutory interpretation. And, and no case has really done that. And when we look at the entire statutory scheme, we're also looking at 71 pages of federal law that have been incorporated by reference into our statutory scheme, which is the Adoption and Safe Families Act. And the Adoption and Safe Families Act actually prefers adoption over lesser permanency goals. And it prefers it in several ways. That if, if a person wants to suggest a lesser permanency goal, they have to do a multi-step process to rule out adoption as a permanency goal. There has to be a conversation with the guardians about whether, about do they know they can get an adoption subsidy, about um, adoption as a better permanency goal. This is in 42 USC 675. And then there has to be a finding about why adoption is not appropriate. So in some ways when the state is involved, it's the inverse of BTB, because BTB says you have to rule out lesser permanency goals and ASPA says you have to rule out adoption before you consider lesser permanency goals. Also, this court was asking about, um, can we look at father's failure to comply prior to the removal of the children? And I think at, that is a crucial time because father knew that the consequence of failure to comply would be that his children go through the trauma of going into foster care. Ms. Pierce? Yes. Ms. Ms. Pierce, you, you will, of course, agree that the, the, the court has to find that the termination is strictly necessary? Yes, yes. Right. Yes. With respect to father in paragraph 35 of the court's finding, uh, and it's the point that Justice Lee alluded to earlier, the court says the court does not know if the father can be successful outside of treatment. How can a court simultaneously say, I don't know if, if, the court, if this person is going to be, um, be able to rehabilitate and at the same time find it strictly necessary when that substance abuse was if one of, if not really, the predominating factor in the termination decision? Well, that's the, the, the strictly necessary looks at the child's point of view and the whole schemata of the child welfare scheme. I don't know that that answer, that's fine. From whichever point of view that the trial court is, I mean, if you read those findings, the trial court is saying father has made a pretty dang good show after removal, pretty poor before removal, but after removal um, is, is crediting father a fair amount. And says, I don't know. The court does not know, though, father can be successful outside of, of treatment. Was there an opportunity here for the trial court to continue these proceedings, to extend these proceedings, to have a longer view of whether the, the father could maintain his sobriety? I don't think so, because under the former um, section 78.6.314, it says that a termination that the court has to have is termination order findings out at the 18 month mark. And so when I said point of view, what I was talking about is a developmentally sensitive point of view, a sense of time from the child's point of view, from the child's point of view, being in foster care. Last okay, so the father got them out on Feb or the court got them out on February 21st, 2020. 
which there was another then at least four months to go, right? I mean, I don't, there, there's a point about it's not clear when the removal date was, whether it was December 20th, December 18th, December 6th. Um, but in any case, there's at least four months. But you're acting like you're, you're, you're saying that the father's entitled to those months. And I'm not saying that at all. I'm, I'm saying I'm asking a question about whether under the statutory structure in place at the time, a juvenile court confronted with this question that says, Father, you've made great progress, um, but I'm just not sure if you can maintain it. And statutorily, I could test this for several more months, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and find, despite my, my not knowing, I'm not saying you can't, I'm, you might be able to, I'm just going to go ahead and terminate now. Well, I would say then that if you're talking about an extension, the burden of proof and the burden of production for an extension is on the parent, not on the juvenile court. So the parent would have to show those factors, and the parent did not do that. And also, I would say- how, how if the court is, how, how is that possible if the court is at the I don't know stage? Not that, not that I, I don't believe it, but I don't know. And Ms. Pierce, if I could kind of add to Justice Monis's question, within the legal standard of strictly necessary. Well, the legal standard of strictly necessary has to be considered in the context of the child welfare law. And the child welfare law, uh, as 42 U.S.C. 678 says, nothing in this code should be construed to constrict a juvenile court's discretion to either not provide services or terminate services based on individual circumstances. So there was no way these children were going to get permanency, and there was no way the court was going to be able to, to give a termination order at the 18-month mark if it were going to extend services to father. Yes, Justice Lee? Let, let, let me give you a hypothetical, and let me preface it with the emphasis that it's a hypothetical. I'm not suggesting that it's what happened in this case, but let's say that hypothetically a juvenile court judge in a case like this one concludes that I really don't know how the, you know, whether the father will be successful a few months from now, but my hunch is that he will be. My, my inclination based on the expert testimony and all the evidence that I have before me is he likely will get there within a few months. But I don't care um, because I, I think that adoption is a better situation and a better placement. Um, and so I'm going to award that. Would that be a legal error to make that kind of a determination? Would that, I mean, could you defend that as being strictly necessary I, um, in the best interests of the children in, in light of all that strict necessity brings in in terms of parental rights? I would look at 78A6509, which is one of the, which is the best interest factors. And one of the factors is whether the parent has and this is key, within a reasonable period of time, made these efforts. And within a reasonable period of time, you can look at the pre-removal services because those are key too. If this court is gonna say they're not key, that we don't count them, well, that doesn't make sense at all. But to answer, to further answer your question, I think the risk to the children is simply too high. If you look at the older child psychological evaluation when she first came in, she was suffering from reactive attachment disorder and from other problems stemming from a traumatic and neglectful childhood. And so to, to put her on the hook even longer and to go through even more uncertainty, that's risking way too much to the child. And when you look at parental rights, this court in NRA BTV says that strictly necessary does not weigh the parent's constitutional rights. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be incumbent on the judge, though, to at least say something about that kind of time frame about the likelihood of the father? Um, succeeding you know either within that 12 month period or the 18 month period that, that, that you mentioned shouldn't the judge make some assessment about that kind of time frame question in order under a clear and convincing evidence standard and a strict necessity standard well i think one other flaw in this underlying flaw in this question is that you're conflating sobriety with being able to parent since this, since he really hasn't ever demonstrated sober parenting or violence-free parenting. Um, the mother's testimony and her two domestic violence assessments said that the violence and the drinking began when the older child was born. 
be simply. Yeah, I, I take that point, and I'm not conflating them, and I'm not suggesting that a, a, a judge couldn't separate them in the kind of determination I'm talking about. I, I'm just wondering whether it isn't somehow baked into the clear and convincing evidence standard and the strict necessity requirement to show your math on that, to, to say something as, as a juvenile court judge about why this is being balanced in the way that it is. In, 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 in light of not just today, it would be a mistake to give custody to the father, but longer time term. I, it would be helpful to have to show your math as you say, and I'm guessing if the, if the, the court were to show its math, it would have said these kids are, are taking, because of the problems that they have, they're going to require highly, highly skilled parents, and that simply is not filed. If you look at his psychological evaluation, he does not have those skills. He might be successful in maintaining sobriety, but he's not yeah. going to parent these children, and I think that's fair. The court could have said that. But when the findings are inadequate, then under State versus Robinson and State versus Peck, this court is to assume the regularity of the proceedings. Yeah, I, I see that point. But thank you. Could I, before you sit down, um, could you address the question I asked, Ms. Marshall? Do, do you think if we were to rule in favor of the father on any of these grounds, but not the mother, not saying that's what we're going to do, but if we were to, um, what what would happen, you know, on remand? Would, would it be a vacature of the in, uh, order where the mother has her rights kind of effectively reinstated as well? I, there, there's no basis to reinstate mother's parental rights. Those are two different analyses. Those are two different cases. There's no reason to, to bring her back into this. And again, it's so it would be so dangerous to the children to to vest legal to vest legal rights in these unfit parents from what they really because that would totally for you yeah, know I, I understand you don't want us to to reverse and remand but but my my question is more if we were to decide that there was some fatal legal error at the threshold in terms of the basic sort of time frame analysis that the juvenile court engaged in and that that specific argument was made only by the father but the the analysis pervaded the the order, you know, such that it infected the way the judge justified his termination of the mother's rights as well as the father's rights, what would be the right way to handle that? Well, you can affirm on any ground, not pled or argued, so long as it's in the record, but you can't reverse on any ground, not pled or not argued. And that's clear from this court's case in State versus Johnson and in State versus Robinson. Justice Simonis, I see your hand. Yeah, but I don't want to step on your response to Justice Lee's question. So once you're done with that, I have a question for you. I mean, I, I think that's a good point that you make. I think this is a, uh, I think that's a good point, Ms. Pierce. I, I think this might be a hard question if we were to, to reach it, but I, I, I think that's, that's a strong point. Thank you. Well, I want to make sure that I understand your response to Justice Lee's question a minute ago. I, I think that Justice Lee was, was uh, suggesting a case in, in which perhaps there, there was not a a, that the juvenile court has not fully shown its work um, in terms of the termination proceedings in some aspects. And, and you suggested that, that under the, the presumption of re regularity in Robinson and Peck, um, we should imply it. Is that right? That's right. So if the juvenile court did nothing but say, um, but recite and say, I find grounds for termination and that it's strictly necessary in, in your world, we would say we would just presume that that all the necessary findings are made. Well, in my world, and it's actually your world because you're you're the folks who came out with the NRA KF case, and in that case, this court said that if you're not happy with the adequacy of the findings, you need to give the trial the the appellant needs to give the trial court the first crack at amending the findings and making them more adequate. But when they don't do that, then you can't argue inadequacy of findings on appeal. So the appellant has to go back and, and say, you've ruled against me, but I'd really like you to make it explicit why you ruled against me in, in this, this setting? This court in NRA KF said exactly that. It incorporated okay. pretty Okay, I, I got you. Okay. That's different than, the, than the, the presumption of regularity, but I take your point. If there are no other questions, then I will <coughs> thank you for careful attention. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Mr. Peterson. 
May it please the court, John Peterson, Assistant Attorney General for the state of Utah. Um, listening to the arguments kind of takes me back to uh, 1994. 1994 is the year that the, the Child Welfare Reform Act was enacted, which brought in the statutes, essentially this is the form we're looking at today. And the basis behind the Child Welfare Reform Act was the problem of children languishing in foster care and interminable juvenile court proceedings. We had, I mean, cases going on for well over two years. In response to that, the Child Welfare Reform Act was enacted and the permanency project also was brought in to make this, bring these cases to an end. And I mean, and I think the, uh, what caused cases to languish this way was this notion of like, let's kick it down the road a little bit. You know, the father's doing a pretty good, yes, Justice Simone. Yeah, but in, in fairness, Mr. Peterson, at the time, we didn't have the same statutory scheme that we had in place now, right? We, we didn't have the, the notion that you had to, by clear and convincing evidence, um, uh, you know, find that determination was strictly necessary. We did not, uh, Justice Simone, we did not have strictly necessary. We did have clear and convincing evidence, yeah, but that comes from have, Santosky in 84. But clear and convincing evidence that determination was strictly necessary. We had we had the, the need for clear and convincing evidence, but not the strict necessity is a relative recent addition. Right. So we were interpreting then a different statutory provision. Yeah, I mean, in part, what I'm saying though is the uh, the timelines were the really the major addition in the Child Welfare Reform Act. The idea that you need to move things along, and you can't just simply hold out hope that these parents are going to come around someday. And you know, and that's why I think it's um, it, I mean, well, the judge did talk about you know, I can't today. I would be remiss in returning these children to you. That wasn't the broader, you know, in reason behind the court. What? Yes, uh, Justice Lee, or Justice Pierce. Yeah, if I, if I can ask you about that, Mr. Peterson, and, and the timelines. I, I understand that um, the the recent amendment, the relatively recent amendment to the statute adding strictly necessary doesn't change the timelines, but does it change the way that the juvenile court should approach the inquiry with inside those timelines? In other words, does, does sort of all those legislative presumptions in terms of keeping children with their parents mean that, you know, if, if you get to the end of, of, or get near the end of those timelines, and there isn't proof that it's strictly necessary to terminate, you know, whereas in the past, before that amendment, we might have said, well, we're not convinced that the parents are making enough progress, therefore, we're going to, to terminate, that the legislature is instructed, if you get to that point, and you can't show by clear and convincing evidence that it's strictly necessary, you don't terminate. And, and that part of what we're seeing in, in cases like this one is a hard time adjusting to that new reality of, of, of the way that the the, the strictly necessary interacts with the timelines. And so I'm just wondering if you could address that. Uh, yes, Justice Pierce. I mean, I mean, I guess, I mean, I, I would, you know, disagree that this is, you know, a sign of growing pains. I mean, I think that, the, I mean, it's always an important part, which I think the strict necessity doesn't change, is the idea of a track record. You know, I mean, you, you come to court with, you know, a week of sobriety. You come to court with two months of sobriety. In this case, maybe be up to six months, but you come upon that from a lifetime of substance abuse and a lifetime of domestic violence. And I think what the court wanted to hear, I mean, the, the children were removed, returned, removed again. And throughout that period, the parents really did absolutely nothing. And if removing your children wasn't enough to like get you moving in a positive direction, then really what would be? And it was finally, not until the father was finally incarcerated and incarcerated, he didn't do that great job either because he was still violating court orders. But once he got out, he finally seemed to make a move in a good direction. And, and the judge, frankly, said, yes, I mean, I'm impressed by what you've done, but your history is still just not very good. And you just seem to fall back on your old ways. If father, from day one, you know, had moved in a positive direction, said, yes, I'm going to separate her mother. We're not going to keep getting together and fighting. I'm not going to get drunk and get in arguments with mom. The court could have had, instead of six months, maybe a year, and then maybe the court, oh yes, Justice Lee. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off mid-sentence. Go ahead and finish your thought. Uh, I said, yeah, the court would have had a year of time, maybe, and maybe the court would have extended services. I mean, because, you know, the uh, the child welfare, the laws are a one-way street. 
you get to the permittee hearing, you decide, okay, you're doing well, I can extend services. You're not doing well, I'm not going to extend services. In this case, they were not doing well. They admit they were not doing well. At the time of the permittee hearing, the court said, you're not doing anything. I have no basis to extend services to you. If they had been doing something, even a little bit, the court probably would have said, okay, I'm at least going to throw you a bone. We're going to let you go on a little bit farther to see if you can keep doing better. But they were not doing well. I mean, the way the act is set up, you don't go backwards and forward. You don't say, oh, now you're doing a little better. Okay, services are back. Now you're not doing, you're doing badly. Services are gone. In this case, they did badly. Services are terminated, and they move towards termination of parental rights, which is the way the act is set up to prevent these cases from languishing forever with this notion that maybe they'll do a little bit better if we just give them a little more time. So the time frame question is a big question for me in this case in terms of trying to understand what the statutory scheme expects juvenile court judges to do in terms of a time frame and whether the judge's findings here were consistent with those time frames. Because it does seem to me that the judge is sort of looking, you made reference to this a minute ago, making reference to past history and expressing probably perfectly understandable frustration with the father and with the mother. But then also expressing sort of, well, on the other hand, you know, very recently you've been doing well, and granted it's post-removal, but I'm just not sure what to make of that. And one, you know, one provision of the statute I'm trying to understand and to think about is in 509.1b, where it talks about taking into account the effort the parent or parents have made to adjust their circumstances, conduct, or conditions to make it in the child's best interest to return to his home after a reasonable length of time, including but not limited to, and then it gives some specific considerations. And I just wonder if that doesn't suggest that if the court hasn't identified something about the length of time that suggests that the parent has already had a reasonable amount of time, sufficiently reasonable to suggest that there's no basis for concluding not just today that it would be irresponsible to give custody to the children, but sort of ever. And so we have to terminate the parent's interest. I mean, isn't that implicit in this idea of a reasonable length of time that the judge has to grapple with that? I think it is. I mean, but it seems to me that the court did address that. I mean, in the paragraph 35 of the court's findings that we've been discussing today, you know, the court said returning the children to the father today would be neglectful. But then the court went on to say the court does not have any indication of future success in reviewing the father's past. I think implicit in that finding is a determination that what the court was looking for was a better track record of success rather than, I mean, it happens in so many cases that, you know, at the zero hour, all of a sudden it's like, wow, a termination trial is coming up. I better like really make some effort here. And there is an effort made, but it's, you know, so many cases we have with the concept of too little, too late, which may seem like a trite phrase, but it's true. Mr. Peterson, is the question for the judge in these cases whether a father could fully function independently as a parent? Or is it whether in the context of, let's say, a guardianship relationship, the father could successfully maintain the relationship? Yeah, I'm struggling with this in the context of a strictly necessary assessment. Well, I guess we go to the question of whether the father could successfully parent, I mean, goes to the question of whether or not you need to, whether there's a basis for terminating his parental rights. The question of whether he could essentially kind of co-parent within a guardian situation is more of this, whether it's strictly necessary. I mean, I think, and so first, I mean, if you find that, no, he can't parent, then you move on to the second part of your question as well. Is having him in the children's lives going to be beneficial to them in the long run? Does he have a relationship with the guardian such that this is a workable situation? Are they strangers? Is it a family member? I mean, so yeah, I mean, those are two parts of the same equation, but they, I mean, the second part is part of the strict necessity analysis. Well, it is the second part that seems challenging because some of your arguments and some of Ms. Pierce's arguments are framed in terms of whether 
And then certainly the judge was looking at whether he could return him to custody right now. But in assessing whether the termination of his rights is strictly necessary, I mean, fitness, he's un, he, he was admitted to be unfit, right? Yes. It's off the table. So it, it's just a question of whether uh, it's strictly necessary to terminate that relationship or whether there's some alternative. So shouldn't we be focused on whether he might successfully contribute or maintain a relationship or whether it be beneficial to the children in something short of full custody, full parenting? Uh, isn't that what is implicated or required to be considered by a strictly a strictly necessary assessment? Uh, yes, I mean, I would agree, I would agree that is that is a determination. And I mean, and, and I mean, this is a case I did feel that the I mean, the juvenile court, I mean, and maybe the court could have explained its, its reasoning on that point slightly better, but I still think, you know, and, and implicit in the court's analysis is the idea of this, you know, the constant substance abuse and domestic violence between the couple. And it's like, and this is just an unhealthy situation for children. This is not a, you know, a situation that you want to prolong and keep in their future. Uh, Justice Simonis. I, I want to make sure that you, you've had a chance to fully answer the chief's questions before I, I go on. Do you have a further question, Justice Grant? Thank you. Um, I, I posed a question uh, to Ms. Pierce about if the, the juvenile court had made some gritty, bare bones findings uh, and nothing else, um, what, whether we would be obligated to affirm in that case. and. Ms. Pierce, in response to Justice Lee's point, first suggested that the, the presumption of regularity would apply. Uh, and second, what I heard, Henry K.S., um, we held that the appellant uh, must then petition the court for most for more detailed findings. Can you help me with that? Can you help, one, help me locate that? Uh, and two, do you, do you ascribe to that notion that if a trial court issues bare bones findings, that it is incumbent upon the losing party to petition a trial court? Uh, for more robust findings? I mean, I, I think the, the, the legal uh, principle that Ms. Pierce stated is correct. I mean, it goes back to this court state, I think of like 438 South May and easy heat case. And the notion that, yeah, I mean, it is incumbent upon the appellant who, if they find and say, well, you know, these findings are, are missing something, it's not a gotcha. Like, I don't, you can't set up the court for error. But I also think that child welfare proceedings are a smidge different than, say, your contract dispute, too. I mean, you, and this court has, you know, required things. I mean, I think the BTB case, the strict necessity analysis is something that this court has required the juvenile court to, and to go through. And I think if the court were not to even address to go through that analysis, even if, um, you know, the appellant doesn't raise an objection, that's probably plain error in my mind. I mean, and, and, and since this court has absolutely required the court to decide whether or not termination is strictly necessity, a strict necessity, I think the court has to do that, whether or not someone, I mean, and I, in, in my case, I think, I, you know, I, I wouldn't even argue preservation if the court doesn't even go through the motions of making the BTB analysis. Is that helpful, Justice Bonas? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that, I mean, as I look at KS, I don't think it's actually in there, so I'm just wondering to find the, the, the predicate for uh, that particular statement. I mean, I know, I know that the uh, 438 South Main case was uh, where I first remember the notion that you have to preserve your objections to the inadequacy of the court's findings. I think it's been in other cases since then. Uh, I see the amount of time, but I, I would actually briefly like to address Justice Lee's uh, hypothetical about what do you do if you terminate one parent and not the other? I mean, because I think that is it's an interesting question, and were this court to go that direction, I think it's an important question. Uh, and I, again, juvenile courts are a little bit different. I mean, if you're dealing with a summary judgment case with multiple parties and they have different interests, maybe reversing at the one is not as controlled. But in this case, they're parents. And if you were, say, to uh, vacate the termination of father's parental rights, let's assume just uh, uh, for argument that the parents are happily living together now. So you're going to, you know, not reverse hers, and, and he's going to parental rights, and the kids are going to be living with both of them, but she's not going to be the parent. I mean, it seems to me that what would probably be necessary is to at least allow, I mean, to remand it and allow the juvenile court to, you know, reconsider the best interest determination as the mother in light of the fact that you just vacated the father's determination. I mean, I think that would be a fair and reasonable way to deal with 
what is the current situation here? What are we going to do? These are these are kids. They're not a piece of land or something. There's uh, familial relationships are important. You can, you can't just ignore those things. So that would be my response. Is that helpful? That is helpful. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. Out of time. Oh yes, I just to Grant. Do you, do you happen to know why Mother's Council isn't here today? Uh, I do not know. I mean, uh, uh, perhaps Ms. Marichelle knows. But thank you, Mr. Peterson. Ms. Marichelle. Thank you. And to start off, um, Mother's Council submits on the briefs, so she just yielded all of her time in oral argument. That's why she's not here. Thank you. I want to briefly address a few points because um, quite a few was brought up. The first is in relation to Section 509 and those factors that uh, Justice Lee mentioned in that particular subsection, because this is actually a legal error that we identified in the juvenile court's decision. The juvenile court made no findings related to the three specific factors listed in the statute in 509. Specifically, and most importantly, the maintenance of regular parent time designed and carried out in a plan to reunite the child with the parent. That absolutely happened here. And more importantly, in every single DCFS report in the record, DCFS reported that father was appropriate and was a good parent while during this parent time, which is the only way that DCFS can really evaluate his parenting skills. So the argument from the GAL and the state that father has had no time to be a sober parent is flatly incorrect and not supported by anything in the record. And indeed, they don't point to anything in the record that would support that. In addition, those facts are undisputed. And under this court's decision in Carbon County, father is under no obligation to present those undisputed facts to the court in order to preserve them for appeal. So that answers a little bit of the, the KF debate um, in terms of whether he had to present those. They're undisputed. There's, there's nothing to dispute in the record. The second thing I want to address is the show the math problem. And this is a problem that is chronic in termination decisions, particularly with the best interest analysis. And this court grappled with that same problem in the last two decisions that, that came up, GD and New York, similar, similar problem. And the reason is because there just isn't a clear framework for how to conduct the best interest analysis. That is why we urge this court to adopt that framework now. And that framework it consists of four things that are supported by the section, the language of section 503. And those are first, the court has to put to expressly apply the presumption that is in the best interest of the child to go back to their family. Second, the court must grapple with the harm of termination. The harm of termination is a certainty. It is backed by research. It will happen unless the child has literally no relationship with their parent, which is highly unlikely. There will be harm to the child from the child's point of view that occurs from termination. The court must grapple with that. Third, the strict necessity, and there's been a lot of discussion about that today, and rightfully so, because it is unclear. Strictly necessary means that it is impossible to serve the child's interest without termination. If there is a way to do that, then the court has to do it. Justice Lee. How, how would we reconcile this idea with the presumption of regularity? And, 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 and and would this be somehow special to parent termination cases? Or what would the implications of sort of, hey, this is how you have to show your math. Uh, what would the implications be for other cases? I think given the statutory scheme and the presumptions involved and the protections involved and the constitutional nature of the rights involved, the presumption of regularity gives way to that. And it it's it is a special case. These are not typical cases. They have special procedures on, on appeal. They have special statutory timelines and protections. They are special. And for that reason, the presumption of regularity should not apply because the burden is so high on the state to make for termination. It should be upheld on, on appeal that we shouldn't just assume that the juvenile court made findings that it didn't make. And that's what it based its decision on. It has to show the math and, and that the, the fourth thing it has to show the math on is, is the best interest inquiry. It has to be a present tense inquiry. It has to look at the parenting ability at the time of trial. And all of the evidence here of parenting ability at the time of trial was that he was a great parent. Every visit with DCFS was great, glowing. There was nothing negative that came out of those, those instances. So the court had absolutely no indication and could not even, even if we assumed regularity proceedings, there was nothing in the record that the court could base the idea that he was not a good parent as of the day of trial. 
There simply was no evidence to do so. Finally, I want to hit on the notion of permanency because the state and the GAL bring it up a lot. It's important to note that in this case, especially if this case goes back to the juvenile court, these children have been moved five times since termination. They are currently in their fifth placement. They were just moved last week again. This is a four-year-old and a six-year-old. This four-year-old has spent half his life being moved from foster home to foster home. So this idea that termination somehow guarantees permanency for children is completely false and is especially false in this case. For this reason, we ask this court to reverse father's termination and to clarify the best interest analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marshall, and thank you to all counsel. We very much appreciate the arguments that have been presented today. We're going to take a recess at this point um, until 12.05, at which time we'll return and hear the case of HITORQ versus TCC Veterinary Services. Court is in recess. Thank you, Your Honor.